Welcome to the Living Witness Broadcast. I'm your host, Pastor Derek Thomas, and my prayer today is that the message blesses you and inspires you to be all that you can be, to reach the world with the life-giving word. Enjoy today's message. God bless. Understand what we've got to understand is that 
as we as we give God all of ourselves and allow God to be God in our lives. What he begins to do, which is the exact opposite of the board game, he shows us in the real game of life that it's not about the things that you, you amass, but it's about how deeply you fall in love with me. And it's about how much you allow me to be God in your life. Amen. And the thing I love about God is that he's a God of second chances and third chances and a hundred chances and a thousand chances and, and a million chances. We've all had second chances. But for the sake of discussion today, we're going to talk about Deuteronomy because Deuteronomy literally means the second law or the second time the law was presented. In other words, I'm giving it to you a second time because what you did is you thought about it like it was a game the first time. I'm giving it to you a second time because you played with it the first time. I'm giving it to you a second time because you didn't take it seriously the first time. But I'm I'm hoping that in the midst of what's happened between the first time it was given to you and this time it's given to you, you come to understand what life is. And God helped me see in a nutshell what life is. If you take the word life and make it an acronym, life is living in freedom every day. Amen. That's what life is all about. Life is about living in freedom every day. That's why the word says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Notice I say, who the Son sets free. Because unlike the game of life, you don't have control. We don't have control of what we do. We don't have control of where we go. We don't have control of what things happen and what things don't happen. But what we do have control of is our relationship with our God. What we do have control of is the choices that we make. Because in the Garden of Eden, we were given the capacity to choose as a result of the fruit that was eaten. That's why when Moses wrote this, he documented what was said. And he, he, he made it crystal clear that, that, that I'm calling everybody and calling heaven and earth to witness. Now, I need you to make a choice. And God is calling us today to make a choice. God is calling us this day to choose if we want to live in freedom every day or to choose if we want to stay in bondage where we are that leads to death and destruction. We might think we've got it going on, but in reality it leads us to death. The word puts it this way. There's a way that seems right unto a man. But in the end it leads to death and destruction. And it may seem like everybody's doing it. It might seem like it's a nice, wide, smooth, super highway. But the word lets us know that straight is a gate and narrow is a way. And there are very few individuals that find it. Because in order to find it, you've got to sacrifice your life by giving your life to Jesus Christ. That he, in turn, might replace that old, messed up life with the capacity to live in freedom every day. Amen. So God is calling us to make the choice today to live in freedom every day. And we do that by loving God intentionally. We got to love God intentionally because what Moses was trying to do here in this text is help us see that there's some stuff that we got to do that's outside of the norm. See, in life, we're taught to, to go out and we got to provide and we got to uh, have creature comforts in place and we got to pay our bills and we got to do this and do that. And I'm not saying that those things don't have to be done. They absolutely do have to be done. But those things are done by the guidance of our God and not by us doing what we do. That's why it says here that you may love the Lord your God. That you may love the Lord your God. We got to love God intentionally. We got to agape God intentionally. We got to make the conscious choice and decision to not only let God be God, but understand I'm in a relationship with God. And if I'm in a relationship with God, I've got to trust God to be God. And I know that if I'm trusting God to be God, he's being God in my life in such a way not to hurt me, but to help me. To increase me. To enhance me. Sometimes enhancement might mean stretching. Sometimes enhancement might mean being uncomfortable. Sometimes enhancement might be might mean being put in situations that at the moment are uncomfortable. But the word talks about, as I paraphrase it, that these light afflictions pale in comparison to the glory that comes afterwards. In other words, it might be a little bit of pain right now, but the pleasure of knowing that I'm a better person because of you, God, allowing uh, me allowing you, God, to be God in my life. Trumps all that discomfort, and before you know it, we find ourselves under the mention in God where people are like, well, what about the pain you went through? You're like, what pain? 
What pain? What, what pain? I, that, that, that pain was nothing in relation to where God is taking me. That pain is nothing in relation to where God is, is moving me. That pain is nothing in relation to how God is taking my life and transforming my life. And the love in the text here that's being spoken of is it, the conscious direction of the mind that's rooted in choice, not emotion. Amen. We got to realize that loving God is a choice. God's not looking for us to have butterflies in our, in our, in our stomach every time we mention his name. Because there are going to be times where we're challenged. There are going to be times we're going to be going through. See, once we say yes to Jesus Christ, it does not mean that we're exempt from trials. In fact, I will submit to you that at times the trials become more intense because you said yes to Jesus. But you got to understand what, what it says in, in, in day one of, of, of the purpose-driven life. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's about God. We gotta understand that at a time when the enemy comes in like a flood, and instead of us turning and blaming God like 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 married couples in relationship, it's your fault. No, 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 it's not my fault. It's the enemy's fault. We gotta understand that God is up to something. God is looking to do something big in and through our lives. But we gotta make the choice that good times, bad times, up times, down times, whatever the times, God is going to be God in the situation. I'm gonna let you be God in the situation. I'm gonna get out of the way and step back like the song says and let you do it, God. Because if I step back and let you do it, what happens is I find myself living out this acronym. I find myself living in freedom every day. I find myself living in freedom every day. Yes, I got bills due. But I'm in freedom knowing that my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory, which are found in Christ Jesus. It doesn't mean that you don't work. It doesn't mean that you don't pay your bills. It doesn't mean that you don't do the things that adults do. It doesn't mean that you stop adulting. What it means is that as you adult, you delegate those things that you've taken on before this revelation that, that, that weigh you down. You take those things and you delegate those things over to God and let God be God in the situation. That means we stop doing what we do. It means we become more efficient at doing what we do. I learned this in a seminar many years ago at work, a management seminar, and it was an object lesson. They gave each of us like three, three ping pong balls. Then they gave us like a ping pong ball for scheduling, and a ping pong ball for payroll, and a ping pong ball for, for, for uh, uh, discipline, a ping pong ball for this, a ping pong ball for that. And we found ourselves, we had so many ping pong balls, they're like, now you got to function and do your job. There were too many ping pong balls for us to get to the, the notepad that had the, the stuff that we were supposed to do on it. So what we had to do was they had another bucket, they had a bucket that said, uh, uh, that, that, that said supervisor. And they said, start putting the things that you can delegate up with that are not right now, but they're important, that, that are next to somebody else. And I started putting those ping pong balls in the bucket. And what I found is that in order for me to get to the point where I could really maneuver and do what I needed to do, I had to learn how to delegate upward and trust that the one that I'm delegating upward to is more than able to do what it is that they've been called to do. Because understand, the job of that supervisor is not to do what I do. The job of that supervisor is to watch what I do, catch this, to watch what I do, and then step in to help me do what I do better by taking things out of my purview that stop me from doing what it is that God has called me to do. God made it clear in Genesis, I called you to do two things. You got two jobs. You got two jobs to be fruitful and multiply. Your two jobs are to be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful. Go out and make disciples. Jesus made it clear. Go out and go to all the world and make disciples. Go out and tell somebody about Jesus. Go out and tell somebody about the good things that God has done in your life. Go out and compel men and women. That means you got to go out and get next to them and let them know, hey man, look, I understand the way that you're going. You think it's right, but it's not the right way to go. And I'm telling you this because I've made that conscious decision and choice that your betterment is, is my primary concern, even if it means the worst for me. That's what agape love is. Agape love is making the choice to give the one loved the very best of everything that you have, even if it means the very worst for you. The object lesson we have for that is Jesus Christ. Jesus went to the cross and died so that we might live. None of us were deserving of what Jesus did, but Jesus did it because he understood that there was a greater dynamic at work. And what God wants us to understand is that if we intentionally make him first in our lives, 
What he does is he steps in and he takes those things that are more than you can handle. He steps in and takes those things that you don't know what to do with. He steps in and takes those things that are in the way from you being fruitful and multiplied. And he takes them and he does what he needs to do with them so that it empowers and equips us to be more effective at our jobs. You know how it is today when people mess up. People are quick to say, you see it on social media all the time, you have what? You had one job, and your one job was whatever it was. Guess what? We got two jobs. Be fruitful and multiply. And we don't want to hear God say, you had two jobs. We don't want to hear that. But what we want to do is live in such a way so that our job is ingrained in everything that we do. It's not even a job anymore. It's who we are. It's the essence of who we are. You heard it said about married folks sometimes. Y'all, y'all, y'all been together so long, y'all starting to look alike. Starting to look alike. You starting to look like her, she starting to look like you. I want to be in God's presence so much that I begin to look like him. I want people to even stop seeing me. I don't even want you to see me anymore. All I want you to see is a Jesus in me. All I want you to see is a reflection of God that I am. All I want you to see is his essence. All I want you to hear is his voice. All I want you to feel is his presence. All I want you to experience is his nature. That's all I want. And that only comes as I spend time with him. And I spend that time with him, not forced, but I make the choice to spend that time with him. I make the choice to love him intentionally. I make the choice to give God everything. I make the choice to do this so that I can be in a position where I live in freedom every day. Because when I allow God to be God and I let him be God in my life, I can live in freedom every day. Because I'm not burdened down with the cares of this world. Because I'm too busy doing what Deuteronomy 6 says in verses 5 and 6. I'm too busy doing this. I'm too busy loving the Lord my God with all my heart and with all my soul and with all my strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. I'm not just giving God lip service, but I'm striving to give God real service in every aspect of my living. Because as I give God real service in every aspect of my living, I'm exalting God. And as I'm exalting God, I'm setting the atmosphere to help, to help people see that indeed, like we just said, it's indeed only him that's doing it. And if it's only him that's doing it, people want to know, let me come to know this Jesus that you serve. Let me come to know this God that you serve. Gives us the opportunity to do our part to bring about the enlargement, to bring about the expansion that God desires to do. But that doesn't happen unless we choose life. Amen. Amen. Doesn't happen unless we learn how to delegate upward and, and put ourselves in a position to do the two jobs that God gave us to do. And we got to be diligent about doing those jobs. And we and, and, and giving us those jobs to do. They're not rogue jobs. And what I mean by rogue jobs, they're not just jobs that you just go out and do any kind of way. Amen. You don't go out and witness any kind of way. You don't go out and live holy any kind of way. There's a protocol that has to be found, that has to be followed. Just like we have to love God intentionally, we've got to obey God unconditionally. Amen. Amen. We got to obey Him unconditionally. We can't obey Him when it's nice outside. If He's telling us to go out and evangelize, we can't say because it's a day like today. I'm not going out there. It's too cold. I ain't going out there. It's snowing. Hello, you got boots and gloves to put on if you got to go to work. Amen. Got a shovel to shovel your way out if you got to go to the store. So if the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is calling us to be about our Father's business, it didn't say in the Word, Jesus didn't say, I must be about my Father's business only when it's summertime. It didn't say that. It said, I must be about my Father's business, period. And far too many of us want to be about our Father's business with a comma after it. Uh-oh. What I mean by this is this. Father, I'll be about your business, comma, as long as I ain't got to talk to so-and-so. I'll be about your business, Father, comma, as long as I ain't got to give my last $10. I'll be about your business, God, comma, as long as I ain't got to have brother so-and-so in my car because I just got a detail. Far too many individuals that have said yes to Jesus Christ find themselves in that place. And Moses even dealt with that as well. That you may obey, it goes on in our text to say, that you may obey his voice and that you may cling to him, for he is your life. Not that car. He is your life, not that ten dollars. He is your life, not that time it takes to sit to sit and talk to that brother or sister. He is your life and the length of your days. Amen. He is. 
Because if we made up our minds to serve God, we made up our minds to love God unconditionally, we made up our minds to give God the very best of our service. Would it not stand to reason that if we're taking care of God's business, he's going to take care of ours? All he needs us to do is get with the program. Just follow the program. I heard, who did I hear say yesterday? I heard a friend of mine say yesterday, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel in doing this. It don't make no sense to reinvent the wheel, but far too many of us have said yes to Jesus trying to reinvent the wheel of evangelism, reinvent the wheel of salvation, reinvent the wheel of sharing gospel, sharing the gospel, reinvent the wheel of doing this thing. God's like, I don't need you to reinvent the wheel. What I need you to do is master rolling on the wheel that I've given you, and far too many of us don't even know how to roll on that. So, when Moses wrote this, and he wrote what he said, what was said, and this version here says that, that you may cling to to him. And it's significant that he said cling to him. He didn't say obey him, because ultimately that's what he meant, obey, but he said cling to him. And there's a reason why he said cling to him. Because clinging in this text here is synonymous with the word cleave that was used way back when it said that a man shall leave his father and mother and what? Cleave unto his wife. And the two shall what? Become what? One flesh, right? So that means that, that that cleaving dynamic and the marriage dynamic meant that you two stopped being two separate beings. You two came together and through God's grace and ordination became one flesh with God as your central foundation. Meaning if you're one flesh, I can't go nowhere without her. She can't go nowhere without me. Good, bad, or different, we in this thing together. But far too many people are pulling like this in relationships and as a result of doing this, there's no forward progress. And what God is saying is stop doing this. Remember, I'm in the middle, God says, let me guide you both. And that's when progress is made. So coming back to where we are now, Moses is saying, this is so serious about you obeying God unconditionally. I want you to look past who you are. You're not even alone anymore. It's not even a single situation anymore. Just like I said back at the beginning that a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and the two of them become one flesh. I need you now to understand that God has given you a second chance. He brought you through all the death that brought you here. He brought you through the destruction. He brought you through your mess up. He brought you through your hands. He brought you through your slip-ups. Now he needs you to cling to God so that you're not even seen anymore. So that you and God now become one. So much so that God can have his way in you. God can move through you. That words that come out of your mouth, man, that sounds like the Lord speaking. It don't even sound like you no more. That don't even look like you no more. You don't, even, you don't even walk the same anymore. You don't even talk the same anymore. It's the other side of what was said so often when I was growing up in church. When, when, we, when we get this thing right, we look at our hands, we look at our feet, they all look new, right? The reason why is that we are new creatures. We're not the same being anymore. Because we've been indoctrinated with someone else. God has been introduced into the equation. And it's no longer just us, but it's God. So what God wants us to do is realize that like a man cleaves and cleans to his wife, or cleaves to his wife, the children of Israel are cling to God just as we should today. God wants us to cling to him. Because there are things that we're going to run into that we don't understand. There are things that we're going to run into that are going to be bigger than we can handle. There are assignments that God is going to give us that are going to blow our minds because in our logic we can't figure it out. God, how can you, you want me to do this, this, and this? You want, wait, wait, God, you want me to do this? Takes us back to when God called Moses. Moses like, well, God, you want, you want me to do this? No, God, you don't want me to do this. Well, look, 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 realistically, God, you, 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 you don't want me to do, to, 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 to do this because Moses had a stuttering problem. And God's like, I, I can, I'm paraphrasing, I, I, I can do what I need to do. I know who I called. I'm not, I, I don't have a, a mental deficiency. I know who I called. And I called you for a reason. I called you because I don't want you to do it in your power. I don't want you to be eligible of speech. I don't want you 
to know how to conjugate the verb to be. I don't want you to be perfect in man's eyes. I want you to be flawed because when you show up as flawed and when you show up as, as, as an issue, that when you show up as having need of things, that's when I'm glorified when you let me be God. And even though God conceded by saying, I'm going to let you take Aaron with you. Let's take him with you. At no point when it came down to doing directly this work until the time came for the priestly line to be established. Do you see anywhere at the most critical times? And Aaron said, you don't see that. It said that Moses said, thus saith the Lord, not thus saith Aaron. Because Moses and God got like this. Moses said, God, okay, if you want to Ministries is a church on the move dedicated to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ through the preached and taught word, community activism and outreach, and practical ministry designed to meet needs, bless hearts, save souls, and change lives. You can sow into the ministry via our cash app at dollar sign LW Ministries 2020. That's dollar sign LW Ministries 2020. Sow your seed into the good works and good ground of Living Witness Ministries today. And thank you for helping us reach the world with the life-giving way. We pray that you were blessed by today's broadcast and would love to hear from you. If you have any prayer requests, praise reports, or would like to learn more about Living Witness Ministries, you can contact us by email at living to witness at gmail.com. That's the word living, the number two, witness at gmail.com or by phone at area code 404-955-8846. Again, that's area code 404-955-8846. Until next time, we encourage you to continue to live your life as a living witness.